got a story. This one is personal and happened to me about eight years ago. It isn't some made up campfire story, but I had figured that I'd still post it here since this thread is empty. I'm a pretty slow typer, so this might take me a while. Be me, 16, working as a farmhand during the summer to make some extra cash. I get room and board, so I also live on the farm at this time. This is in Nebraska, by the way. Anyways, the first three weeks go by smoothly. Simple, but tedious work. One day, the farmer, his name is John, comes up to me. John says, Hey, Anon, I think someone is fucking around in the field at night. I found some corn stalks trampled, torn up, and thrown all over the place for the past two days. Do you think you can just watch the field tonight and make sure no one comes back? I'll even give you tomorrow off. Except quest at PNG. Kind of excited for guard duty. And really excited that I get tomorrow off. Later that night, before I head out into the field, John gives me his shotgun. Tells me to, if I see them, just scare them off. Don't shoot anyone unless I absolutely have to. And that he'll come running if he hears a shot. Yeehaw.jpg. Sit on lawn chair next to the field. Do a couple rounds. Get bored real quick. About halfway through the night, I hear giggling coming from the corn. The sound of children giggling. Three spooky five me. Eventually work up the nerve to walk up to the edge of the field, shotgun in hand, and yell in my best intimidating voice, Y'all leave here and never come back, or there'll be trouble. There's a little bit of rustling, and the giggle stops. Work up even more nerve, and decide to go in. Rustle up the corn to make sure they leave. I don't hear anyone giggling anymore. In fact, I don't hear anything anymore. No bugs, no wind, nothing. Dead silence. Hoping to not get children of the corn, I get out of there, praying that the child giggling didn't start back up. I make it out of the cornfield and, still not hearing any giggling, I take it that whoever was in there ran off. I didn't check the entire field, but whatever. Adequacy achieved. Dawn comes, see John, Tell him what I heard, and we walk through the field together. Everything seems fine. Go back to the house to take a much-needed rest. Wake up that afternoon. Head downstairs. John is outside talking to the sheriff. John's wife tells me that, while the field was fine, someone snuck into the barn and killed one of the cows. Go out. Talk to John and the sheriff about what I heard. Go see the cow for myself. Full-scale mutilation. Drained of all blood. Missing eyes and organs. Precision surgical cuts all over the body. Sheriff is lost. Asks us if we knew anyone who could have done this. A la mouse that PNG. John pipes up, and through some sort of Olympian level mental gymnastics, says that it's still probably just some asshole kids. The sheriff and I are less convinced. Regardless, the sheriff takes his word for it and leaves. John tells me that we are both going to do a stakeout tonight, with me watching the cornfield and him watching the barn. Seems like a bad idea, but okay. That night, I take the shotgun, he takes the rifle, and we both report to our designated places. I have got a bad feeling about this. I sit on my lawn chair and wait. Hours later, giggling starts back up. Corn starts rustling. I, very timidly, yell out for whoever is there to identify themselves. Instantly regret that. Out of the corn walks a seven foot tall humanoid with antlers. It's always seven foot or nine foot tall. Anyway, a very bestial looking face with snout. What appeared was a shit eating grin, large claws, and with an occasional spike jutting out of seemingly random places on its body. Oh, God, oh fuck. Fire shot at it in fear, fall over in my lawn chair pick myself up, and start booking it to the barn. We're talking Usain Bolt levels of speed here. And still, I can hear the thing chasing after me. Trip into a gopher hole. Fucking gophers. I kinda just go into a fetal position and start screaming. Not my proudest moment. I can hear John finally get his ass out of the barn. Start yelling and start firing some shots. I black out. Wake up the next morning in the house. With John, his wife, his daughter and the sheriff all standing over me. John told the sheriff that some random schmuck attacked me. I tell the sheriff that it was dark and I couldn't ID the guy, so he leaves. Once I'm feeling better, John takes me out back and confirms that 
I'm not crazy. He says that once he got out of the barn, he saw the creature on all fours leaning over me. He yelled and fired six shots at it before it got back up on two legs and ran through the field into the nearby woods. Oddly enough, his description was different than mine in that he said that the creature had a bumpy, bulbous head instead of an animal-like snout. After this, we searched the farm for any clues. We find a white, viscous liquid all over the property. Assume it's some kind of blood. After this, we go into a full alert mode. No being out after dusk, always carrying guns, etc. No more problems for the rest of the summer. I'm still in contact with John today. He is a bit touchy on the issue, but claims that he has never seen the creature again. Although, he will occasionally hear something pacing around the farm at night. Does anyone know what this could be? I'll try to sketch a picture in a minute, but I'm pretty bad at drawing. Here's the best drawing I could make. Mind you, I couldn't see the feet very well. And in hindsight, the antlers were certainly longer, but besides those things, this is fairly accurate. I forgot to mention, the spikes were everywhere, not just on the sides. I just drew it like that because, well, I'm terrible at drawing. All right, I guess I'll post a story or two if that's fine. This one obviously isn't mine, but it is a retelling of the Pensacola Sea Serpent encounter. I'm gonna do it in green text because I like green text. March 24th, 1962. Pensacola, Florida. Five teens want to go free diving off the wreck of the USS Massachusetts. The five teens, all male, are Eric, 16, Warren, 17, Larry, 15, Brad, 14, and finally, Edward McCleary, 16, who was the one recounting the story. The USS Massachusetts is about two miles off the coast on a sandbar. Because of this, Part of the wreck can be seen sticking out of the water. They grab a raft, change into their bathing suits, and spot the part of the wreck sticking out of the water and start paddling towards it. The water is extraordinarily cold. On their way to the ship, a storm starts coming in. They decide to paddle back to shore, but they instead get washed down to sea. They tried to wave down a boat for help, but the boater was apparently retarded and just waved back. They instead decide to tie onto a nearby boy and wait out the storm. The boat capsizes, but they manage to flip it over and climb back on. They wait out the storm. The sea finally becomes calm. Everything goes completely silent, and a heavy fog rolls in. They all sit there and make small talk for a bit, waiting for the fog to disperse so they can pedal back. The water around them becomes much warmer. Larry hears something in the distance and tells everyone to shut up and listen. Suddenly, the smell of dead fish hits them, and they hear a massive splash. The waves from this splash were big enough to break over the side of the raft. Through the fog, they see something that looked like a ten-foot fall telef- <laughs> Through the fog, they see something that looked like a ten-foot tall telephone pole emerge from the water. It straightens up, pauses for a moment, and then arches and dives back underwater. They all get confused especially being that they didn't even properly see the thing due to the fog. McClary jokes that it was a sea monster. Why would you say that at PNG? They start hearing a high-pitched hiss, which sounds like it's getting closer and closer with each secession. They all understandably panic. They decide to put on their diving fins and jump into the water. This part sounds a bit odd, being that it seems like no sane human would jump into the water with a supposed sea monster. McClary later justified this, claiming that they were all terror-stricken, and feeling the need to escape, decided to leave the tiny raft. McClary tells everyone to swim for the wreck of the USS Massachusetts. Behind them, they hear more splashing and that weird hissing sound. The fog starts to clear up, but the water starts to get colder, rougher, and night starts to fall. Every once in a while, Eric would call back to make sure everyone was fine. Eventually, they hear a scream lasting about 30 seconds from behind them. They hear Warren call out, Help me! Help me! It's got Brad! I've got to get out of here! Warren's voice was suddenly cut off by his own screams. Everything goes silent. They can't find Warren and Brad. Not able to do anything, the three remaining boys continue swimming. 
After a while, McCleary looks around and realizes that he can't see Larry. They dive down, trying to search for him underwater, but they can't find him. They decide to keep on swimming. Eric starts sinking due to cramps, so McCleary grabs onto him and they swim together. It's the dead of night now, and everything is pitch black. Nearby, lightning lights up the area, and they find that they are pretty close to the USS Massachusetts. A giant wave separates the two, but they both keep swimming for the ship. As lightning lights up the area once again, McCleary sees the telephone pole-like figure break the water, open its mouth, and dive on top of Eric, dragging him down into the sea. McCleary describes the creature as having a neck that was about 12 feet long, brownish-green, and smooth-looking. The head of the creature looked like that of a sea turtle, only elongated, and with a fuckton of small, sharp teeth. He did not see any fins on the creature's sides, but claimed that he saw a dorsal fin on its back as it was diving. The eyes looked green with oval pupils. McCleary pulls himself onto the wreck of the ship and stays there for a while. There is no sign of Eric. He eventually works up the courage to get back into the water and swim the two miles to shore. He claims that he did not remember swimming back to the shore, but instead imagined himself peacefully sinking to the bottom of the sea and laying on the soft sand. Interestingly enough, this sort of blissful peace is also reported by surviving drowning victims. Eventually, he finds himself back on the beach. He finds the strength to pull himself out of the surf. He finds a nearby tower that he climbs into and falls asleep in. He sleeps for a while, hearing strange voices in his head throughout the entire night. He wakes up, falls out of the tower, and some kids find him face down on the beach. He gets sent to a nearby hospital. Hospital claimed that he was suffering from shock and exposure. The director of a search and rescue team comes in to talk to McCleary. McCleary tells him the story, of which the director surprisingly believes. A news crew also interviewed McCleary, but decides to not run a story about a sea monster. According to Coast Guard reports, McCleary swam for over five miles and was in the water for nearly 12 hours. Interestingly, the news article altered this fact, claiming that McCleary only swam for two miles. I have no idea why they would fabricate something this mundane. Anyway, a body washes ashore a couple of days later. It's the body of Brad. Autopsy report claims that Brad had drowned. And that's the end. To my knowledge, they never found the bodies of the other kids. And oddly enough, there have been reports of similar looking sea monsters off Mobile, Alabama, which is only 58 miles away. It's a pretty interesting story and is convincing enough in some ways to make me think that McCleary either saw or thinks he saw a sea monster. This is far from the creepiest story in this thread, but it still trips me up. Never green texted before, so I'm sorry in advance if I break convention. I've never typed out this story in full, so I'll try to keep it detailed. TLDR hallucinated an imaginary good Samaritan bro who drove me and my friend home after a concert for free. Be me. September 3rd of last year, me and my buddy, A, got tickets to see Carpenter Brute in Baltimore. We live about five hours south, so we book a hotel to stay at after the show. Wages, so the only hotel we can afford is about 40 minutes from the venue in downtown. That's all the groundwork for the story. We made it down fine, even though there was a really heavy rain. We get to the hotel and crash for an hour or two before we decide to go downtown. My friend A doesn't want to drive anymore after five hours in the car, so we decide to take an Uber downtown. Make it downtown, fine. Get some good pizza and hop in line for the show. Doors opening in a little over an hour, so we're first in line. As the line fills up, we notice more and more people dressed up. Lots of black jeans, leather vests, and boots. Start talking to this dude behind us about the show, the music, and Baltimore because he was a local. Tells us his name is Will probably mid-twenties. Black leather jacket, black leather pants, gloves, and face paint. Super cool guy. I'm usually pretty introverted, but we spend the hour talking about a bunch of stuff. Probably feel comfortable around him because he's like a foot shorter than me. My friend A spends his time on his phone. Tells me he's just tired from driving so much earlier. Eventually, doors open up and we all fill inside. Me and A go to the merch stand. 
Will goes to the stage and we get separated. Don't see Will again for the whole show. Cue two hours of sober moshing to a French hardcore synthwave. Concert ends. Me and A are covered in sweat and leave the venue. It's about midnight now. We're both tired and don't really want to go anywhere else, so we decide to try and call an Uber again. A's phone is not working. Keeps getting connection errors, payment errors. Every single time he tries to use the app, try mine, and we get the same thing. Oh shit, that gif. Figure that the app was probably overloaded because so many people were trying to use it at once. So we decide to walk a few blocks down the street and try again. Walk around 20 minutes and try. Error. Walk another 20 minutes. Error. Look around and realize that we've walked outside of the gentrified, lit up downtown Baltimore. And now, we're in the real downtown Baltimore. Say fuck it and try to walk back to the venue thinking maybe one of the staff can help us get a taxi. Walk for about five minutes before we notice a person in all black coming towards us from the opposite direction. Short dude. Recognize that? It's Will from earlier. I explain our situation to him. I know this is weird, but our phones aren't working. Could you call us an Uber and I can maybe send you some money to cover the cost? Do degrees. Pulls up the app on his phone and sees that it would cost us like 60 bucks for a ride back to the hotel. Nah, man, you shouldn't have to pay that much. My car is parked in that parking garage over there. Your hotel is on my way. I'll give you a ride back. Start getting a little creeped out. Me and A look at each other, but Will seems like a nice guy. And we don't really have any other option, so we agree. Follow this dude who we never met back to his car through the sketchiest parking garage I've ever been in. Neither of us know the area, so the whole time we're just texting each other shitless. I even share my location with my mother just in case. Eventually, though, we get back to the hotel. Will explains that he took a back way to avoid the busy downtown traffic. I tried to give him a $20 bill, but he refused and said that it was no problem. We go inside a little creeped out, but glad to be at the hotel, and we crash. And this is where the weird part came in. Next morning, wake up in the hotel. Say to A, man, that was sketchy last night, wasn't it? What do you mean? Taking that ride from that Will guy last night. My friend looks at me like I'm retarded and asks what the fuck I'm talking about. Tells me that we didn't meet anyone named Will last night. Says that I was talking to someone in line, but it was just a few words with a normal guy, and I never asked his name. I ask A how we got back to the hotel last night. Oh, we... Um... We... Um... A says he doesn't remember coming home. He just figured he was tired, and I called another Uber or something. Neither one of us has any idea what really happened that night. Did we get attacked, or was this paranormal? Pick Related is a mini-disc that, quote-unquote, Will gave me in his car before we left. He said he didn't really have a player, so it was useless for him. At some point, I must have misplaced it because I couldn't find it the next morning. I got an incident I can tell y'all about to kill time while I'm on call. I'm tired of green texting and this one is a little on the long side, so I figured typing it out normally would be best. This happened when myself, my brother from another mother, and some other guys decided on going for a cross-country road trip the summer after we graduated from high school. Some of us were signing up with the military when we got back. Others were going off to their college of choice. But one of us, Baker, he had plans of going off to Europe for a few years to backpack and to see the sights of the old country. He was also a massive paranormal fanboy. Anything remotely creepy or paranormal would grab his goat and he would run off headfirst into whatever situation had arisen just to sate his curiosity. Most of us liked paranormal shit as well, or at least tolerated his shenanigans, because usually it ended with us exploring some old busted ass buildings or houses, and once, an entire beach steamboat that had seen much better days. So when Baker announced he was plotting our course across the country to hit as many paranormal and creepy spots as possible, none of us were surprised, nor did we express any sort of argument against it. We just rolled with it in the spirit of adventure. The trip would go on to be a fucking blast. Some spots were genuinely creepy, others were more of a letdown. Mostly, the fun came from each of us trying to scare the bejesus out of each other whenever possible, which admittedly 
was whenever we could do it. And also the fun came from the journey to each spot. But that all changed when we hit New Mexico. Baker was originally from New Mexico, having moved out of there when he was still shitting yellow in his diapers. And he was almost hell bent on having us stop as much as possible while we were driving through there. We didn't mind, most of us had never left our home state, so everything was new to us, and we were generally enjoying ourselves. We made a stop in Animas at Baker's request. Apparently, he had family that lived there, and they had agreed to let us crash at their place for the night. We figured, why not? We wouldn't have to set up camp or rent a hotel, and Baker would get to see family that he had never met before. It was a win-win. We pull up to their place. Baker hops out and walks up starts talking to an older guy in his 50s who walked out of the house for a few minutes. And then, the two of them walk back towards our vehicle. Introductions are made, and we find out that the guy is Baker's only uncle. We shoot the shit for a bit when his uncle tells us that he has this old bunkhouse from back when they had a little ranch, and it's ready for us to stay in. This was considered a great win for us, as that meant no double bunking and that everyone actually got a bed for once instead of a sleeping bag or a cot. So we pull around to where it is and unload our stuff for the evening and get our beds packed and set for the night. We get dinner situated and end up eating outside around a fire pit alongside Baker's uncle, who's just shooting the shit with us while catching up with Baker about his family. Pretty soon though, of course, Baker turns to talk towards spooky shit in the area and we all see his uncle's face sort of fall like someone who's trying to not think of some bad shit that happened, so people don't realize that they had a nerve. He sits there for a few minutes, silently, Baker badgering him about it, until he just gets up and walks inside. We all start giving Baker shit because, from what we can tell, he just ruined his uncle's night, and he falls into that defensive silence of someone who knows they fucked up. But a few minutes later, his uncle walks back out, a bottle of tequila in hand, and eight glasses. He passes one to each of us, pours each of us about three fingers worth, and then takes a good long swig of it while staring into the fire. Then he takes a seat and he starts to talk. He begins to tell us about an event that had happened roughly 30 years before, about how he had lost a friend and a lover to it, and that if we ever really wanted to hear something creepy, then we would shut the fuck up and listen because he was only going to tell us this once. So we all sat back, buttoned up our lips, and we let the man speak. It started off with him telling us about his friend and his friend's brother, and how the three of them had met while working as miners, and how quickly they had become best friends. He said he would become a miner so he wouldn't have to deal with working the ranch, a job that he hated, and that the two men he met made the job bearable, but only barely. Since they were Mexican, they usually got the short end of the stick, but as long as they were together, they could deal with it. Then, the uncle and his friend's brother slowly began to realize that the two of them were more alike than they thought, leading to the two men confessing that they swung for the same team. And quickly, they began a relationship in secret. He said he told us this so that we would know how painful it was for him to talk about the event. Baker looked surprised. He didn't have the best track record with same-sex couples, and the shock of finding out his only uncle was a part of that lifestyle was pretty evident on his face, but he kept his mouth shut as his uncle continued on. A few months into the men meeting one another, ranches in the area started reporting missing animals, or of finding animals dead and desiccated, where the day before, the animal would have been alive and in good health. Of course, that got the local ranchers agitated, and regular hunting parties were organized to see if the animal, or person responsible, could be found and either killed if it was an animal or brought to justice if it was a man. I don't need to tell y'all what kind of justice his uncle was talking about. I'm sure y'all can put two and two together. All of this continued on into the winter months. At this part, his uncle took a short pause, still staring into the fire, then took a shot from the tequila and continued. The ranchers were getting more and more angry they were losing animals, but had yet to find any sort of tracks or traces of whatever or whoever was doing it. Hell, even the miners began to talk about it, whispering that if it was some sort of animal taking down cattle 
whatever it was, would be able to take a person down as well, especially if it was like a mountain lion or similar. They also began to talk about hearing weird noises in the deeper mine shafts, stuff like faint growling or what sounded like claws moving across rock. Some of them began refusing to go into the deep unless they had more than one other person with them, something that earned those miners nervous laughter from the rest of them and cause of them of being cowards and pussies. Baker's uncle told us how he, his friend, and his lover would routinely be forced to work the deeper shafts since the others would either refuse to go down there or were higher seniority on the minor totem pole and that it would just be them for hours at a time down there. Eventually, the three of them stopped bitching about it and just focused on their work, figuring that the faster they dug during their shifts, the faster they would get out. He said that they would occasionally hear the noises that the other miners reported, but they would try to ignore them as best as they could, and they would focus on their work. And it worked, until the night that it didn't. He told us that they'd gotten the graveyard shift that night, as well as the deepest part of the shaft that they were assigned to. So, off the three went, grumbling under their breath about the whole situation. They stepped out of the elevator, and the guys going up had scared looks on their faces, so Baker's uncle asked one of them, that he was on somewhat cordial speaking terms with, what was wrong. The guy seemed to hesitate, and then told the three that they all had been hearing strange noises coming from the lower shafts all shift, and that they had been pretty disturbing. But they just attributed it to wind gusting through from an unknown cave connected to the shaft, and that the proper authorities would be checking it out the next day, to make sure that part of the mine shaft was in no danger of collapsing, but for them to be careful since they were going to be right smack dab in the middle of it all. That didn't make the three men feel any better as they walked towards where they'd been assigned, setting about getting to work. Ten minutes into their shift, the lights went out. From the way he said it, it seemed like the lines had been cut. One moment, they were all lit. The next, they were all standing in complete and utter darkness with only the sound of each other breathing, letting them know the other two were still there. They scramble to get their helmet lights turned on, and while doing so, they start hearing the claw on the rock noise approaching fast. He said that, as far as he knew, the other two felt like he did, that something bad was coming their way, so the three of them began booking it back towards the left. The clawing sound picked up speed, almost like it was running full tilt at them, when he heard his friend scream and pain, and fear. He said his lover and himself turned to see his friend and lover's brother lying face down on the ground, his body going limp, as what they described as an albino, almost hairless rat dog, took a chunk out of his neck, looking at the two of them before letting out a squeal, like a cross between an angry cat hissing and grease sizzling on a hot skillet. The two of them turned again and began running again, him saying that he disgustingly hoped that whatever it was would have stopped to eat his friend so the two of them could get away, and being absolutely terrified when he heard those clawing noises getting close. That's when Baker's uncle stopped talking again, still staring into the fire. He was quiet for so long that we began to assume that he was either not going to tell the rest of what happened, or that he had gotten too drunk to remember it. Neither of those were the case. That's when I felt him grab me and throw me out of the way, and I saw the thing fly past me, barely missing. We weren't too far from the elevator, and thankfully, the power was still on in that part of the mineshaft, so we hoped like a motherfucker that the lights would act as a deterrent, and they didn't do shit. He told us how his lover pushed him into the elevator as the rat dog thing charged at them and tried to get in while the thing was picking itself up off the ground. Already starting to charge at them. The thing was fast, too fast, and in what he said was almost a blink of an eye. It was on his lover, biting and scratching at him before finally tearing out his throat. He said for the second time that night, he felt disgusted at how he felt as he slapped the ascent button on the lift, part of him hoping it would hurry, and the other part cussing at him for being a coward and not helping out his lover. The lift began to ascend, and he said the thing locked eyes with him and screeched, charging. 
Luckily for him, it apparently could not climb, and it barely missed the lift. Smacking headlong into the mineshaft wall, he said he could hear it screeching the entire way up, with the miners who had gathered around the top of the elevator shaft hearing it as well. One of them asked where the other two men were, and why he looked so terrified. So, working quickly, he concocted a story about how there was an albino wolf that had somehow gotten into the shaft that ended up killing both of his partners. It was here that his uncle fell silent for the third time that night, this time for much longer. So long so that we began to worry about him. And finally, he did stand up slowly and he excused himself. All of us were quiet after he went inside the house, contemplating whether or not what we had just heard was real or not. Most of us came to the same conclusion, that his uncle was telling some form of the truth. But Baker, Baker came to a totally different conclusion. Baker wanted to go see this shaft in person. We all began discussing it amongst ourselves, and eventually we all, minus Baker, came to the conclusion that Baker had a death wish but he would just not let it go, and eventually persuaded every one of us that it was the spirit of Avenger calling, and that there were eight of us, so whatever it was wouldn't try anything, if there was in fact something to the story. So we all filed into the bunkhouse with a plan forming to go monster hunting. The next morning we awoke, wondering if Baker would be dead set on his little monster hunting adventure mostly because all of us during the night had come to the same conclusion. None of us wanted to go spelunking in some old mine shafts and run the risk of something happening and all of us getting trapped down there. But when Baker awoke, the first thing out of his mouth when he walked out to the kitchen was to ask if we were all ready for it. Half-hearted affirms were had from some of us. Others were saying various other things about safety issues, but he just brushed them aside and simply stated that if we weren't going with him, he would go to it alone. The rest of us shared a look, knowing that none of us were going to let our friend do something as stupid as that, alone. So, we gathered together outside, and we went over the plan. Admittedly, it wasn't much of a plan. It went like this. Step one, find the mine shaft in question, which Baker set off to question his uncle about. The rest of us were left to come up with step two, which at the end of our brainstorming session, composed of us taking some form of weapons with us. Two of us had handguns, one a little 38 revolver that one of the guy's dads had given him in case we ran into trouble on the road, and the other was a high power that the guy religiously carried, and still carries. The gun guys amongst us were not confident in the stopping power of the 38, but figured between it and the 9mm that we'd at least be able to injure it enough to make it back off. The rest of us were relegated to walking sticks that were more like wooden poles, since that was all we could find laying around that area. Step three wasn't even considered, and in hindsight, we probably should have come up with one. But hindsight is a bitch, so we aren't to talk about it yet. Baker walked out about half an hour later. In his hands was an old map, which he gleefully yelled at us as he walked over it was one from the early 70s, with all of the mines in the area marked, and the one in question circled with a black marker. He informed us that it was about an hour's drive away, and asked if we were ready. So, with our poles tossed in the back, we stopped at a store to grab some flashlights and bottled water, then headed out into the desert on our monster hunting expedition. The way there, we were all mostly silent with Baker in a passenger seat and my brother from another mother driving, with another of us reading a map to try and match up service roads with the map that Baker had. And surprisingly, we managed to find the mind after about two hours of backtracking and arguments. The entrance had a few dilapidated buildings scattered around. What we figured would have been the main office and rest area, along with machinery that looked like pulleys for the elevator or mine carts and some rails for said minecarts. There was also an old rusted out pickup truck parked close to what we thought would be the office. And one of the guys, a car guy through and through, lamented about it, I guess to try and lighten the mood a little. We scattered around the area, looking but not really knowing what we were looking for. Honestly, hoping for someone else to finally take the plunge 
and walk into the mine itself. And, wouldn't you know it, Baker was the first one to do so. He walked over, looked the entrance over, and then declared he was going in, which brought our attention back to why we were here. So, almost single file, we marched into the mine, flashlights at the ready. The inside was littered with mining tools, lying here or there. Debris like old and newer beer cans and trash. Some broken down mining carts as well. And we all agreed that we wouldn't be trying to descend using the elevator shaft. And instead, opted to follow the rails further in. We did this for a bit, thanking the flashlights that we had, as the sunlight died down pretty quickly past the entrance. And once we rounded the first corner, it was non-existent. The temperature also dropped a few degrees, something that we were all thankful for, as it was a scorcher of a day. And every now and then, we would hear water dripping further ahead of us. So we, or Baker really, decided to use that as a destination. His thinking being that if there was something down here, it would need to drink. And water dripping meant that it had to be a puddle, or similar close enough. So why not start there? The walls of the mine shaft had some graffiti here and there, but it didn't go too far in. We stopped seeing stuff like that about 10 minutes around the first bend that we took. One of the guys thought that was odd, as back home, he would find graffiti all over the place and old mine shafts, even deeper ones, since people tend to use them for a partying and the farther in you are, the less likely the police or game wardens are to keep going in to evict you from the place. We brushed it off, but... He had a point, though none of us wanted to say that. The water would drip about every minute or so, and eventually we found the source. A crack in the ceiling that was allowing the water to drip into an old rusty bucket. This caught our attention, as cracks just don't open over conveniently placed buckets so it can catch whatever drips out. And Baker took it as a sign that something was down here. Someone in the back spoke up about maybe teenagers had done it during a party or something, but Baker pointed out the lack of trash and graffiti in the area, which silenced him and silenced all of us for that matter. Baker, always the confident idiot, declared that he was going deeper, since in his mind, it was obvious his uncle was telling the truth, and whatever it was just had to be a little further in. We hated him for being so goddamn right. We continued to follow the trails and eventually coming to a larger room in the shape of a circle. And from what we could see, it must have been something like a crossroads type room where mine carts could be sent off to different parts of the mine. A few broken or rusted carts were still on some of the rails with some pickaxes leaning against one wall and what looked like a small office shed against another. We sort of split apart and began looking around the area with Baker and myself checking out the office. The inside held an old-style desk and chair, a fridge, some file cabinets, with paper littering the floor. Everything was dusty as hell, and from the paperwork I read, it just looked like somewhere they kept haul amounts and worker timesheets. Nothing too interesting. Baker had rifled through the desk, finding a set of old keys on a rabbit's foot keychain, and the two of us figured that they belonged to the truck up top. That's when one of the guys called out for us to come to him. So the pair of us walked out and over to where the rest of us were gathering. The guy was knelt down, his light aimed at the dirt floor, illuminating a set of tracks that led off down a part of the shaft that we hadn't been yet. They looked like dog prints, but longer and with an extra toe. The spacing between inch print indicating that whatever had made them was long itself. We all looked at one another and Baker had a look on his face that portrayed what he was thinking. Oh, fuck. There is something down here. That was when we heard it. It sounded further down the shaft we were all currently clustered up against, and all of us turned our lights to peer into the darkness. The sound of a hammer conking, letting us know our 38 friend had drawn his weapon. The sound we heard was sounded like bones scraping against bare metal was slow, almost like whatever was causing it was doing it to try and unnerve us, and it was working. My brother from another mother was the first to voice the opinion of us getting the fuck out of Dodge right then and there. But Baker, fucking Baker, he wanted to at least see whatever it was, to see if it was just a normal animal 
or if his uncle was actually telling the truth. So he took a few slow steps into the shaft, then picked up the pace. The rest of us, not wanting our friend to get attacked, cussed his ass out, but we ended up following. 38 revolver and high power near the front and on either side of Baker. With each step we took, the noise got louder and more frequent until we heard a low hissing begin from ahead of us and around a slight curve of the tunnel. We stopped as one, our nerves beginning to fray, when Baker took one more step towards the noise, and then it happened. Something pale, wrinkled, and about the size of a mastiff charged around the corner, out of our lights hitting it square on at once, which seemed to blind it for a few moments, letting us get a good look at it. Baker's uncle had not lied to us at all. Whatever it was, looked like a rat and dog had somehow crossbred, but along the way, it had lost all of its hair. The claws on it looked similar to a rat's, but more squared at the tips, almost like they were meant for digging. The eyes were jet black and about the size of cue balls, its ears laid back against the head, its tail looking like one belonging to a dog with mange. It didn't stay stunned for long, but us, we were frozen, especially Baker, and that's when the thing lunged and grabbed him by his leg, and all hell broke loose. The thing began trying to drag Baker away from us, Baker kicking at it with his free leg, and our two gun friends running up to get close enough to shoot it without hitting Baker. 38 friend dumped all six rounds into the thing's hips, causing it to let Baker go and start going after him. High power friend began to fire center mass into it as two of us grabbed Baker and began to drag him away, getting his attention away from 38 friend. We heard the unmistakable clicking of a dry chamber as he mag dumped into it, then began cussing up a storm as he reloaded and fired some more. The thing decided that we were too much at that point and retreated back the way we came, and we chose that moment to scoop Baker up in a fireman's carry and get the fuck out of Dodge. Our ears were ringing, our blood and adrenaline were pumping hard, and we were running like madmen. Then, we heard it, the sound that thing had been making, but coming from various other mineshafts. We all turned into track stars, not wanting to be caught by a group of whatever the fuck that thing was, and we soon found ourselves looking at the entrance to the mine. We spilled out into the sunlight, hoping and praying that they wouldn't follow us and we made a beeline for a vehicle. At least, we would have, but we had company waiting for us. Parked behind our vehicle sat three SUVs, and around those stood a ground of around 12 men in uniforms, wearing carriers and with rifles at the ready. We skidded to a stop, looking at the group who was yelling at us to raise our hands and to not try anything funny. The guy carrying Baker said that our friend needed medical assistance, and one of the men said that he would be handled once they knew that we weren't a threat. One of us, I can't remember who, yelled about not worrying about us, and instead they should point the rifles into the cave, since at this point, you could still hear the hornet's nest that we kicked up going off. Three of the men moved to the entrance and took position, while the rest covered us, and two more began frisking us. The whole time, the one who seemed to be in charge eyed us, even more so when the revolver and high power were placed on the hood of our vehicle, and then he questioned us. Baker, thankfully, did all of the talking, probably because he was in pain and just wanted the shit to end. At the end of it all, the man called all of us idiots and said that we were lucky to be alive, and then ordered one of the men to begin cleaning up Baker's wound. They had taken our IDs, and while the man spoke, one of the others took photos of them before passing them back to us. He told us that we were on government property and that we were trespassing, but that they would let us off just this once, and that they know who we are and where we lived. So, we should keep everything hush-hush if we knew what was good for us. We all agreed, and once we were given our IDs back, and the two guys were returned their weapons, we sped out of that place as fast as we could. All of us were quiet on the drive back to Baker's uncle, and when he saw all of us and the bandages on Baker's leg, he said that he warned us and he called all of us stupid fucks. We spent the night there, all of us sitting around the fire and passing a bottle around, each of us in deep thought 
at what had happened. I spoke up once, telling everything what I think we were all feeling. We should just go home and forget this day and never talk about it again. The next day, we thanked his uncle for letting us stay. Then we piled into the vehicle and began the long drive back across country to home. We didn't stop very often, only to change Baker's bandages, and we were back home in like three days' time, having alternated between drivers. My family asked how the road trip was, but they could tell something that had happened. However, they never pushed to hear about it too hard. My little sister knows some of it, and Baker's parents as well, since his uncle called a few months later to check on him. But outside of that, we don't speak about it to each other. At least, the ones of us that are still alive. 38 friend bought the farm in Iraq three years later to an IED. Baker enlisted as well, and was killed in Afghanistan about a year after 38 friend. Baker had been dead set against joining the military. But after what happened, something changed in him. The rest of us still keep in contact with each other, and we get together at least twice a year to remember Baker and 38 friend but we never talk about that time in New Mexico. Only reason I told you all is because even if those men somehow find out about it, I'm dead in a few months anyway, as I have pancreatic cancer and the treatment isn't stopping it any. I hope y'all will appreciate this story, even if most of y'all think it's fake. Just take some advice from me. Don't go exploring in old mine shafts in the New Mexico desert. You might not come out, or you may end up hurt and no one wants to die alone in a mine shaft, away from their loved ones. Post your Mandela Effect stories, or offer explanations for the Mandela Effect stories of others, and actual explanations with source, not just, you misremembered, lol. I'll start. I have three. One, I remember when I was a kid, so this would have been anywhere between 1998 and 2002. My dad told me he read in the paper that they had discovered a new bird, smaller than an ostrich, but bigger than an emu, and it made this harsh, bark-like sound. Number two, in my late teens, early twenties, I recall the news talking about a strange asteroid that was in Earth's orbit. They said it had odd marks on it. They said that astronomers, they said that astronomers say it has always been there, and they just somehow didn't notice it until they noticed it. And number three, the Lindbergh baby's head was found at the bottom of a sewer pipe and his body was never recovered. I saw this in a YouTube video back when YouTube was still cool. There were crime scene photos and everything. I've tried looking up these, but I get no results. When I was in middle school, I wasted some time memorizing the list of US presidents until I could name them all in order. No particular reason for this, I just had nothing better to do. I've long since lost this ability, but at the very least, there couldn't possibly be a president that I hadn't heard of, but I had absolutely never heard of Martin Van Buren until I saw him mentioned in some random YouTube video recently. He seems to be a forgettable president, but at the very least, his name should have been familiar to me who stared at the list of presidents for way too long. For years, the island between Britain and Ireland was known as the Isle of Man, M-A-N-N. -N. Then, suddenly, it lost its second N. The Soviet Union flag. For me, it changed around 2021. What did it look like? It didn't have the star, and it was even more glaring to me since a friend and I had an inside joke between each other, in which we would send each other Soviet Union commie-related memes that would always include the flag in one way or another. I even asked my friend, who also didn't remember the star, but since he has no skeptical mind whatsoever, he chalked it up to never noticing the star beforehand, despite him also being a bit of a history buff. Yeah, wait, where did that star come from? When I saw the first Lord of the Rings in cinema, Gandalf said, run you fools. But now, when I look at it, he says, fly you fools. This has been fucking me up since last summer. 
It's really the most intensely I've ever questioned reality, but it requires some background, I think. So my roommate and I would watch Mandela Effect videos on YouTube all the time, because we thought it was absolutely retarded. You know, like, objectively, so many Mandela Effects are very obviously just people not knowing shit. So, we would watch these videos and clown on them pretty regularly. And I remember very specifically one that came up in a lot of the videos we watched. It was about the Thinker statue, and how people were convinced that his hand was on his chin, even showing pictures of people posing with the statue, with their hands on their chins. But in reality, his hand was against his forehead, almost as if in grief, rather than contemplation. My roomie and I did think it was strange that there were people posing wrong right in front of it, but chalked it up to pop culture. Except, then one day I woke up, and the thinker had a hand on his chin. I immediately asked my roommate to confirm that this was not right. We looked up old Mandela Effect videos that we had watched, that we knew mentioned it, and wouldn't you know, now the narrative is that people remember it being on his head. The same day, while I was mid-fucking crisis, I also saw that the Fruit Loops had been on an end cap at the grocery store the day prior, were now fruit, as in F-R-O-O-T, loops. Another one that I remember seeing in videos and scoffing at. I will say that I had this experience, apparently called flip-flopping, immediately after verbally challenging the Matrix to, quote, just fuck my shit up. I really don't know what to make of it. It still fucks me up to think about sometimes. Oh, shit, another weird one. This one happened more recently. I watched that movie Barbarian back when it first came out, and my friend, who recommended me to not look up the director until after I watched it, were both big fans of Whitest Kids You Know, and didn't know Zack Kreger was directing now. And when I looked it up, I saw that he had a cameo in the movie, the scene where Justin Long is driving and on a conference call. Zack is one of the people in the office it cuts to, but then, when I watched it again to show someone else. I waited through the whole first part of the movie for that scene so I could enjoy it knowing the context now, and it never came. They never cut to the office in the movie. We just hear the other end of the conversation in the car. Instead, Zack had a cameo as a guy at a bar, a scene I didn't even remember happening the first time I watched it. I remember hearing a radio news snippet that Miley Cyrus was in a serious accident in an exotic car. A Lamborghini? Somewhere in the Badlands outside of LA. And that they would update us as more information comes in. They never brought the story up again. And there seems to be no evidence of this ever happening. But I swear, hand on heart, and with absolute sincerity and perfect recollection, that I heard a report of this on the radio. It was around 2009. I remember Ron White dying. I remember thinking... Aw, oh, man, he was pretty funny. Then, not being surprised that his liver killed him. I was so sure of it that during a conversation I brought it up. They said he was still alive, and I was like, no fucking way. So, I looked it up. And the man is still kicking, and he stopped drinking. I am so fucking confused. Even three years later, I just don't get how he isn't dead. Like, I absolutely remember it. What the fuck? Ed McMahon never delivered giant checks and balloons to prize winners. This video proves it actually happened. There was also an episode of Scrubs where he delivered a check, but the video has strangely vanished. In Field of Dreams, the famous line, If you build, they'll come, is now, If you build it, he will come. In Forrest Gump, the line, Life is like a box of chocolates, is now, Life was like a box of chocolates. If you listen carefully, it almost sounds artificial. Mr. Rogers' A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood has changed as well. I could go on, but I'll probably get stopped by a CAPTCHA or a ban. Reminder that false memories are a psychological concept, and it was invented by a cabal of elite pedophiles and their paid-off or complicit doctors to help them delegitimize victims.